Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, you've heard the words that we have proclaimed through music in this place, so my prayers now. Your Holy Spirit has been made to feel welcome in our hearts and in this place as we worshiped you. Father, help your scripture to come alive. Give us truth. Change our hearts and our minds and our lives to focus for the next 30 minutes on who you are in our lives and who you've created us to be. We'll be sure and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Calvary. Woo, y'all are good and awake. I love the fact that you guys are awake. Greetings from Thailand. Our, our team has made it to Thailand. They uh, Actually, they're about 12 hours ahead of us. Uh, so just be in prayer as they are on a medical mission and an English teaching mission to whether they're teaching English, whether they're providing medical uh, benefits, whether they're just having a conversation with those that are around them. I don't know if you've ever been in a foreign country where English wasn't the, the dominant language that was spoken. You don't want to uh, uh, miss speaking. You want the message that you have to be clear. And so pray uh, that God's message would be clear as our team leads people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus as they're in Thailand for the next 12 to 14 days. Uh, last couple of weeks, we have been journeying on this topic called the project. It's the Nehemiah project, and we've been talking about and challenged. Ch Pastor Chad has challenged us to, to do some things in our own lives. And if you haven't been here, let me bring you up to speed right quick, a little background for you. Nehemiah was the servant to the cupbearer to the king. Pretty important role, meaning this, that if the, the king wanted something to drink, the cupbearer tested it, drank it, beforehand to make sure nobody was trying to poison or kill the king. Uh, apparently, Nehemiah was one of those lively, bubbling, enthusiastic types of persons because if you read carefully in the scripture, the, the, uh, the king and the queen noticed that there was something wrong, that he was down. And so they asked him, are you sick? Well, no, I'm not sick. Well, what's going on? And Nehemiah actually risked uh, he, he took a big risk when he asked the king or told the king what was going on in his life. He said, here's the deal. Uh, my homeland, the land of my heritage, the land where my relatives grew up uh, is in disarray. And I've gotten a message. The wall around the city is falling down. The gates have been burnt or torn down. And wow, I, I, you know, king, since you've asked, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I want some time off. I don't know really how long a time it's going to take, but I want some time off. So the king granted that. And he said, and by the way, I'd love to have a letter of protection that you could give me to take some of your troops, take some of the folks around me to, to provide an escort to the place that we're going so that we can get there safely. Granted. And King, while you're at it, and you just got to love Nehemiah. If you're a salesman, you want to be a Nehemiah salesman right here because he went ahead and just asked for the whole thing, right? He asked the man who had the resources. He said, by the way, would you give me a letter to the, to, to the guy that's in charge of your forest? And would you provide the resources, meaning the timber? The things that we need to rebuild this wall and to rehang these gates. Would you, would you finance the project for us, basically, is what he was saying, granted and done. So Nehemiah left on his journey, wound up in Jerusalem, went through the city and surveyed and, and made an assessment of what needed to happen. And obviously, he's looking. And he sees that these walls and these gates are broken down and torn down, and he sees an opportunity to rebuild. And so he challenges, after his assessment, he challenges the folks in that community to rebuild. So if you have your Bibles, that's where we are now. Turn to chapter 3 of Nehemiah. And if you don't have a Bible, in the pew there's some Bibles that are, that are like this. And we designed it this way, that you can have this Bible, take it with you. And actually, I'll give you a heads up. It's on page 505, where we're going to study from today. Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, if you've been reading ahead, you probably already looked and you saw that about every fourth verse, there was a who begot who and who was kin to who, and the names are about this 
long, right? And because I'm not well-versed in Hebrew, we do have someone on staff that could announce those, but I, I'm like, okay, Lord, it was important that you put it in there, but I'm just not going to confuse the folks and have them walking out of here. And the only thing that they remember after 20 minutes with me is the fact that I mispronounced probably every word in there. I'm going to do a little summary, and here's the summary. About every four verses, it gives the name of someone who was living in an area along the wall section, and they took the responsibility, whether they were a priest, whether they were a leader, whether they were a council person in that area, they took the responsibility of rebuilding the wall that was in front of their place, their home place. Shoring that up. And remember, the reason why they wanted a wall and gates that was there was to keep the enemies out. To keep the enemies out. And as they assessed and as they looked at that, um, Nehemiah had an opportunity to watch each individual in those areas do what God had equipped them to do and take responsibility of the area that they were responsible for. Now, as we go all the way through that, there's a particular verse in verse 14 that we're going to talk about a little bit later. But I've invited uh, a guest to come and to share this morning uh, because we've assessed the, the project here at Calvary. And I've invited a guest to come and share with you this morning. Uh, and so here's what I want you to do. The project that Nehemiah was focusing on was building the and rehanging the building the re, building the building the there you go rehanging the gates. I got to tell you, y'all said good morning louder than anybody else, but boy, y'all dropped the ball on the wall and the gate thing here. But let's put the wall and the gate. Rebuild the. Ah, there we go. And rehang the gates. I want you to keep saying that to the top of your lungs until I get this guest. Rebuild the wall. Rehang the gates. Wall. Gates. y'all doing? I heard y'all screaming and hollering about walls and gates. Is there something going on around here? Do you want me to pose? you want me to kiss them big old guns up there for you? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, it's them is Daisy BBs right there, man. Red Riders. All right. Uh, y'all, y'all might have, have heard about my cousin. My cousin Larry was over in Laughlin this weekend. He was doing a comedy show over there. Larry the Cable Guy, well, I, I'm his cousin, and I'm Chet. I am Chet the Wi-Fi Guy. <laughs> and some of you are laughing about that because y'all already been on my network here, ch- checking it out and connecting to, to the Wi-Fi system that's in, in this here auditorium, right? This means yes. Now, work with me. This is an interaction. Pastor Chet told me that y'all would talk back to me when I asked you a question. That meant that I wanted an answer. Whoo, y'all are getting smarter as the minutes go by. So here we are. As we're looking at this, there was a, a program that was assessed, and here's what we found out on the assessment of the program. We found out that there's a question that needs to be posed, and here's the question. Are you guys building or are you just watching? Are you building or are you watching? Watching. Some of you just sitting here watching. And I'm going to get to that part here just in a little bit, but right now I want to remind you. Remember, Nehemiah went, he assessed, he saw the situation, it was in despair, and you were rebuilding the and rehanging the. There was a need for protection for them. Well, guess what? I understand that over the last 10 years here at Calvary, that y'all have grown from three services to five. See, y'all are so smart. Y'all can count all the way up to five. 
Man, I was 32 before I could get to five. And y'all just did that right off the bat. Of course, some of you are might older than 32, but we ain't going to talk about that. But anyway, you've grown to five services. And in those five services, from bed babies all the way up to the more mature that are in here, there's about 1,300 of you that's been a visiting and going and part of this Calvary project and movement. Is that, would that be a pretty good assessment? And my understanding is, as you look around, it's comfortably full. And according to statistics, now I'm not real big on statistics. I understand that most of them are just made up on the spot, so I'll just make one up right here. Once you get to be about 80%, you stop growing. And I'm looking at this here auditorium, and y'all about 80% full. So that means there ain't a whole lot of more growth going to happen in this service right here. And guess what? The other services, the other five services... Woo! Y'all are real smart in here. The other four services, but you did the five because I held it up the way to follow directions, the rest of you. Don't be so smart next time, right? <laughs> the other four services is about 80% full as well. And so there's, a, there's an opportunity for us to grow. And so as we look at this, oh, by the way, did I tell you in that assessment? Did I understand on Sunday evenings, y'all have a bunch of youngins that come around and meet up here about anywhere from 50 to 60 to 70 youngins on Saturday, Sunday evening. Is that, is that true, Brother Bell? Yeah, Pastor Chet told me about you. He told me to watch you, buddy. <laughs> Got my eye on you. But that don't include that number. And then on Monday nights about 6.30, there's something that goes on around here called Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> Woo! Look at him. She is celebrating it, too. Folks is celebrating their recovery from habits, hang-ups, and all sorts of bad stuff or good stuff. Either way, you know, that's going on. And there's about 100, between 100 and 150 folks that meet on Monday night. That ain't in there. And then there's 150, right smart, about 150 youngins that meet here Monday through Fridays. Now, they won't be here the next couple of weeks. They're on something called fall break. Can you imagine fall break? They ain't been in school long enough to have no break. I was in school for about 12 years before they gave me a break. And that was only the fourth grade, so I don't understand that. But anyway, that about, on Wednesday morning, there's about 150 youngins, and they ask, invite their kinfolk, their grandparents, their grandma, their grandpa, their cousins, their nephews, and anybody in the neighborhood to come, and they have a chapel service on Wednesday that number ain't in there either. Wow. If you did the math, that's how many? Eight services that, that be a whole lot more than 1,300, and most of them are still growing. So I think that's a pretty good assessment of the situation. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. This means yes. Work with me here. This means yes. This means no. Yes. Good. All right. Now, so here's my question. Are you guys part of the watching crew or are you part of the building crew? Now, some of you may be part of the building crew and just don't realize it. Any of you ever been asked, well, when y'all going to build on that sweet water property that y'all got or why are y'all building? I want to give you 35,000 plus reasons why Calvary is going to build on that property. From my understanding, there's over 35,000 plus unchurched folks that live in Lake Havasu City. Over 35,000. We ain't got enough fingers and toes in here to count up to 35,000. Can you imagine if we committed to start a praying for them 35,000 folks? That God would let us have all 35,000, not just one or two, not just 350. If we was to ask God, God, we want all 35,000 of them to have a relationship with you. And we want to provide a place for all 35,000 of them to meet. I think that would be a pretty good reason to build, wouldn't you? Now then, you, you might be part of that. You might not be, so you might just be sitting there watching them 35,000. Now, some of you 
are doing a real good job of this because you got folks sitting in the pew with you that you invited to come and be here today. Anybody get invited by somebody today to come here? You did, didn't you? Yeah, baby girl, come up here. She done good, too. I was watching her. Whoo, she was having fun. You got invited. How many of you are inviting your friends and neighbors that you come into contact with that may not have a church family? Now, I'm not a talking about them folks that's attending other places. I'm talking about if we got 35,000 folks that ain't got a place to go, wouldn't it just make sense to invite them to come here? Because them would be our friends and them is our neighbors. And this is our area, kind of like Nehemiah was. In the Jerusalem area, this is our Jerusalem. We just call it Lake Havasu City. And we're going to invite them. And so here's my question. Are you inviting the folks that you encounter? Are you just watching them go by and letting life go by and letting them struggle? And not inviting them, not encouraging them to come into a place that's nice and comfortable and clean. And hear the, 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 the truth of the gospel and allow God to change your life, not you. By the way, it ain't your job to clean them up. That's God's job, not yours. Or how many of us in this room have family that's here? You got family sitting in pews next to you in here. See, I got family sitting over here on this front row. By the way, that little pretty girl that's right in the middle is as our daughter-in-law and she's going to have a grandbaby for us here in about April. <laughs> Woo! Oh, excuse me. She's going to have a grandbaby for Pastor Chet, not me, right? Oh, you weren't taking the picture? Sorry. Now, how many of you are leading your own family to come be part? Of this magnificent, wonderful thing that Pastor Chet keeps telling me about and Pastor Chad keeps preaching about. And the OC, man, that's a cool dude. Did you see his handlebar mustache? Made me kind of jealous. I keep doing that, but mine just keeps disappearing. I keep doing but Anyway, anybody that's got initials for a name got to be a pretty good fella, right? OC. Of course, I understand he's the other Chad. I'm not real sure what that's all about, but okay. But anyway, they come and they're part and hear the gospel. So are you leading your family to come and be part of this? Or are you just watching your own family struggle? In simple terms, are you using what God has given you to get her done? You know, that's one of them phrases that my cousin keeps using. It's a family phrase, by the way. It ain't his. He takes credit for coining that phrase, get her done. Can you say that with me? Get R done. Now, most of you have been sitting there wanting to say it ever since I stepped out, but you just wasn't bold enough to go ahead and say it, right? So go ahead and just let it out. Get R done. Now that we got that taken care of, are you using what God's given you? In other words, every one of us in this room has been given a measure of influence. Do you know what that means? That means that you get to speak into the life of somebody that's around you. If it is nobody else other than that person that's looking back at you in the mirror every morning or every evening when you look in that mirror. You got influence. Say that with me. You got influence. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that influence that y'all recognize that I got influence. Thank you very much. Now, this is what I want you to do. Say, I got influence. You do. Every single one of you got influence. And so here's my question. Are you using the influence that God gave you? Because my understanding is Pastor Chad a couple weeks ago challenged us to pray and ask God to change our lives. Ask God to help us to become exactly what it is that God created us to be. And he asked us to look God in the face and say, God, what part of this project do you want me to do? You see, Nehemiah looked the men in the face that was around them, and he said, here's the project, boys. What y'all going to do? And every one of them took their own section. And Pastor Chad asked each one of us to look God in the face and say, God, what do you want me to do to help build a kingdom? Matter of fact, in your sermon notes, I understand a couple of weeks ago, there was a list that they put in there with names, positions, and uh, 
email addresses. And I know some of you are using them email addresses because I got Wi-Fi. How about you? You know, some of y'all sitting here with Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi? Are you with me? All right. Now, some of you have connected. Some of you took the challenge. Some of you heard God say, hey, I want you to connect. Here's an opportunity for you to connect. But some of you are still sitting there going, you know what? I ain't going to ask God because he's liable to tell me something to do. And if he tells me something to do, I am just going to be compelled to do it. But if he don't tell me, then I ain't compelled to do it. <laughs> Wrong. You see, God works this way. He's going to give you an opportunity to join him in the ministry and the things that are going on. But if you choose not to join him, he's going to raise somebody else up and let them do your job. And I don't know about you guys, but I want to be doing what God created me to do, and I want you to do what God created you to do. You see, everybody can't have this glamorous job of standing up here looking pretty in front of everybody like I do, right? Can't do it, can they? You just have to do what God created you to do. Now, here's another part. Did you ask God? Did God give you direction? Did you ask God, God, what about the resources that you've given me? Lord, what do you want me to do and what do you want me to give? And how simple can that be to ask God? What do you want me to do and then just do it? But some of us come up with this complaining fit that some of you do. You know, know what a fit is, right? That means you argue back and forth about what you're going to do and what you ain't going to do. And most of the time when you ask about it, you start making excuses. And I call those the yebbits. Any of you guilty of having a yebbit party? You know, oh, Lord, I do that. Yeah, but Lord, I ain't got enough time. Lord, I got to go to work. I got to fix the house. I got to do all of this stuff. Yeah, but Lord, I ain't got enough time. Last time I checked, from the day of creation, according to what I understand in this here Bible, in Genesis, God created seven days, and they were 24 hours long. At least that's the way we measure them now, right? And I don't think he increased or decreased any of them days. They're still seven days, ain't they? So we still got the same amount of time that he created. So why are we using that as an excuse? Because that's one of those yebbits. Yeah, but Lord, I got more month than I got money. Ain't no way I can give nothing. here. I got all of these bills and I ain't got no money left, Lord. I can't do that. Yeah, but Lord, you know this folks is a whole lot more talented than I am. Did y'all notice these folks that was on the stage, Mr. Ben, just a beating them drums and playing the guitar and Patrick up here and folks are dancing and a singing up here? Man, they so gifted. There ain't no way I could compete with them, especially that pretty little one on the left over there with the curly hair that's sitting over here by my daughter-in-law's called, I think that's Pastor Chet's daughter, ain't it? Yeah, she's good looking too, ain't she? And she can sing. Woo! But you can make excuses. Yeah, Lord, I get up there and sing, but I can't sing like them, so ain't no need me getting up there, right? Yeah, but we're filled with the yeah, buts. Here's one that really gets us going. Yeah, but that's somebody else's responsibility. That ain't mine. I'm too young or I'm too old or mature or I'm too thin or I'm too fat or I'm too tired or I'm too skinny or I'm too this or I'm too that. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Or, you know what? That's what we hired the preacher for. That's his job. Let him do that instead of me. That's his job, right? I do it, but that's his job. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. We could keep on with them yeah, buts until y'all was tired and wishing that I would shut up and yeah, but go home. <laughs> so could I challenge y'all to do something? Could I challenge y'all to have a yeah, but barbecue? How many, how, how many of y'all like barbecues? Now, I ain't talking about that little old putting a weenie on the grill. That's grilling stuff. I'm talking about barbecuing. I'm talking about large hunks of meat on nice coals that's burnt down, slathered in that good old barbecue sauce. That's a barbecue, right? You know what I'm saying? Making you hungry, ain't it? Because some of you are thinking, man, I wish you'd shut up so I could get down to barbecue bills now. Barbecue bills going to make out today because we talking about barbecue, right? Now, here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want you to take all them excuses that you've been making, and I want you to put them on 
a place and have a barbecue. I want you to get that fire good and hot and put all them excuses in there and say, Lord, here's the deal. I've been making excuses. First of all, why I ain't talked to you. Second of all, why I don't have enough time. Third of all, why I ain't got enough resources. I ain't using the time, talents, and gifts that you gave me, Lord. And I want to I wanna take those away. Lord, I want you to take those away. I want to put those out there and I want to barbecue those and do away with them. Because I'm going to tell you something. Philippians 4.13 says this. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Not me. You, each of us use that for ourselves. You see, the community that Nehemiah was ministering to, that was rebuilding, he asked them to do their part, right? And so they started doing their part. So here's my question. Are you going to do your part? Are you going to be involved? Now, every one of you walked in here, you either opened the door or you walked across the floor or you sat down in a place. Do you realize who made that? just wonderful for you we call it in most businesses not just here but in most businesses support staff any of you ever been part of support staff support staff ain't one of them glamorous jobs I'm just going to here to tell you anything tears up it was your fault and you get to fix it right but I'm going to tell you something I don't believe that there would be a business that would be as productive or, or run as well if it wasn't for their support staff and especially here at the church such things such as taking out the trash. It don't get up and take itself out there to the dumpster. Somebody gets to do that. Gets to do that. How about the toilets and the bathrooms around here? They're clean. They keep them clean around here and in restaurants and places and all that we go to. How about this? Some of you are sitting in here right now, and your youngins is over there in the nursery, and I'm pretty sure that at some point in time, some of them had poopy diaper. And they get to change them poopy diapers so that you can sit in here in a comfortable environment and enjoy what's going on. That's called support staff. You just think about all of those non-glamorous things in businesses work because of support staff. So I'm going to ask you a real question, a real tough question. How many of you truly have ever been part of support staff in any form of business or in the church? If you have, would you stand up? Would you stand up right now in any business or in any ministry or in any church? Look at this. Look around you, will you? Look around. Look at this. First of all, let me tell you thank you, thank you, thank you. And second of all, let me give you a hand. Thank you for serving. You can sit down. You know, it wouldn't happen without the support staff. It absolutely would not happen. You know why? Because the folks that you just saw stand up in their business or in their church said, you know what? You matter. Look at the folks next to you. Just look at them. And if you can say this with all sincerity, say it. You matter to me. Now, don't say it if you don't want to mean it now. Don't just say it because I asked you to. You matter. Look. See, look at him. We care enough about you to make sure that you're more comfortable, that you have a clean, safe environment to be part of. And we want you, every single one of you, to build a relationship with God. First and foremost, we want you building a relationship with God. And second of all, we want you to be able to build a relationship with each other. And so here's my question. How can we encourage you to grow in that area? You see, we just took the time to thank the support staff of Lake Havasu City. Boy, them folks know how to get her done. Would you agree? They do. And if you're willing to adopt the get her done philosophy that we talked about in Philippians 4.13, we can grow united in love and in purpose, which, by the way, is the goal at Calvary, to grow united in love and purpose. Because we're going to get her done here. With God's help, God's vision, we're going to get her done. Are you going to do your part? Will you pray with me?
Father, thanks that you give us an opportunity to serve you in this place. And Father, we can challenge one another to, to do their part. God, right now you're challenging us to do our part. Father, whether it's praying for those 35,000 plus that don't have a church, whether it's providing the resources to have a facility for them to come and worship on a weekend, and Father, whether it's inviting and leading our own families, we ask that you give us insight, that you give us encouragement, that you give us grace to move forward and not be satisfied where we are. See the vision of our community that you love and that you've given us an opportunity to, to become part of. That you would raise up leaders. Father, that you would change our lives and help us to become what it is that you've created each one of us. Father, that you'd speak clearly to us. And we'd be sure and praise you. And Father, as we come to your table called the Lord's Supper. We're reminded of the sacrifice that your son Jesus made that we could enter into a relationship with you and on the night that your son Jesus was betrayed. Father, he took the bread and he took the cup and he offered it as a reminder, as a remembrance of who you are in our life. So Father, as we come to this table, help us take it worthy of you. and Help us take this opportunity, Lord, just to worship you through taking of these elements. In Jesus' name we pray.